be from Jack and Lupe. So, so before I pass the mic to them, just tell you a bit of the history of database operations in Rush. Just a brief one. So, at first, I was the only person doing all the database administration work. So, Jack came in about May, uh, November of 2015. And then, Lupe came in in October of 2016. So, they are both, so Jack is, if you consider, if you exclude me, Jack is the most experienced database operations engineer we have in Grab. And so the most challenging thing in Grab is we keep doing new things, we keep rolling out new services. Uh, the scale keeps changing, so the environment is always different. Every few months you have to learn new things, you have to do completely different things. So I'll let Jack and Lupe take over and tell you what those things are. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Lupe, I'm database engineer from Grab. So uh, today uh, it's a great honor for me to be here to have this talk with you guys. Um, our topic today is how we scale MySQL with AWS. So in the following skit, we will go through the different phases of our database infrastructure, as well as the challenges, the issues we have met at each phase, uh, as well as the corresponding optimization we have met for having a better database um, performance. So I'll start with our... I'll start with our initial design. So in the first place, we only have a very simple and straightforward design. We only have one MySQL database, which is also our main DB. Uh, we also set up a replication for it. So uh, at that time, we are uh, only fully uh, rely on AWS CloudWatch as our wanting tools. So uh, we can see the architecture, all our service actually directly talk to the main DB. We apply the right read uh, separation, so all the writes goes to the main DB and all the reads goes to the replica. So uh, with the rapid growth of our company, we soon start having the database issues. So. There are the three, three issues we mainly face. Uh, the first one is we feel like we lack of the visibilities of what happened in our database internally. Like I mentioned before, we only have the CloudWatch as a monitoring tools. So when there is an issue happen, we can see the CPU spike, the IO spike, or the replication lag. But those are the consequences. We actually have no idea what it caused those things. So we want to have more control of our database. Uh, the second issue actually is, uh, we call it, we can scale up the database, but we can scale out. What that means, means we all know database, uh, AWS provide us a different kind of DB class instance for us to choose. So when we feel like the DB instance reach certain uh, performance limitations, the best way we can scale it up actually is to upsize the, uh, the DB instance. But there are always a limitation, like after we already upsize it to the, like the best machine, what else we can do? And the third one is uh, we only have one replica, which have to support all the operations, rig operations. So when the peak hour comes, the heavy load coming, it always brings us a replication lag, actually, which uh, affect our service. So what we have did to solve this problem, so we call it service sharding. Basically, the idea is we're sharding our main database based on the each service. We start moving all the tables out from the, our main DB, and so each service actually have their dedicated database, and then we also set up the replication for each service. And at that time, we also start using WebCode as a monitoring tools, so we can have more information about what happened inside the database. So by end of the 2015, uh, 2015, we already have 50 plus database. So this is the architecture. We can see that at that time, like different service already talked to their own database. So by applying this approach, actually we definitely reduce the, uh, the load on our main DB. And actually we also ensure the independency before our different, like between the different service, like if there something wrong happens on the, they have a say, actually the 
steal the service B can still work. So I would say this approach definitely solves a lot of issues, but it's definitely not perfect. We're still having new challenges. So those are three issues we had. Um, the first one is, uh, like I mentioned, like each service only have one replica. So it's not able to support different kind of use case, the read user case. So we're thinking about maybe we'll create different replicas for it. The second one is um, we started use the calls as the monitoring, but we still lack of the alerts. We remember there's it should happen actually uh, one day uh, we're doing some DDL, actually which triggered the MySQL bug, so the database gets stuck. But it's not done, it's not completely done, so it didn't trigger the multi failover. The database just refused all the connections. So we don't have alerts for that at that time, So which caused our like more than one hour stop time. So we are thinking about adding our own tools to adding more alerts. So the third one is, yeah, compared with the first stage, like definitely we have more visibilities on it, but we still want you to know more. We want to fully calculate the database. So I think it's probably for me to stop here. I will invite Jack to show you more information about how we solve this problems and what is our current stage, which is our next move. And that's all for me. Thanks. Let's welcome Jack. Uh, hi. I'm Jack, uh, database engineer in Grab. So thanks, Lubei. So here we saw some issues uh, for service sharding, which we met. So how we solve this one? Sorry. So OK, we are using the replication shardings. As we mentioned, there is only one replica for one master. So one replica is not able to support all the operations on the replicas. That's why we create multiple uh, rep replicas for one master to for different purposes. Um, as long as we already have VV context and our monitoring tools, but we still feel we still feel like we are lacking of monitoring. We want to monitor more to get more alerts. So we are start to build our own monitoring bots. At that time we already have more than two hundred database instances in our AWS platform. So this is how our architecture at that time. So from here you can see the first application server actually the, the query is a replica two, and the others actually the query is a replica A. So we all know we can build the different index on different replicas. So we, can, we are doing using these ways to solving the to serve different purpose to faster our queries to make sure our apps are running very well, fast enough. Yeah. So here I'm going to introduce our own monitoring box, how we, we start to build our monitoring box for to monitor MySQL. So actually, as we know in MySQL 5.6, there's no timeout for the query running. They, they introduced the features in 5.7. So we monitor the long query by ourselves. We try to prevent this kind of queries, which is running for a few hours. Because we do make a case, there's some queries running for a few hours, but nobody realizes it. At the end of the day, we are causing a lot of issues, like, like the CPU spike, these kind of things. So we're also monitoring our slow queries. We digest the slow queries and store them, store them together. Yes? Oh, this one? Oh, OK, OK. OK, so for the second part, that digest the slow query results, integrate with our Jira. So we are using some tools called um, PT Query Digest to, to do the digest slow queries. After that, we store all the slow queries together. Then we integrate with our Jira. So we will Jira the, the person to say, hey, there are some slow queries. Jira our developers, please help to solve it. So we also push slow query logs to Scala, and we also integrate the alerts to Slack. Because we are using Slack to communicate, so we are, we are integrated with Slack. So every, 
every time when there's something wrong, we can get it immediately and solve it to make sure our apps running very well. Also, we do some we do have some customized alerts integrated with Slack. Uh, once some issues happen, usually we, we need to have this kind of InnoDB status. So we are push uh, show engine InnoDB status to S3 bucket. Actually, it's for every server, every uh, per minute. And more and more. Yeah. That one. Oh, so here is how the architect works. So I just take this instance as examples. So we are using the VC app to monitoring the database. So we, we monitoring DB slow queries, push all the slow queries to the Scala, as I mentioned. And also we integrate with our Slack. Besides that, we have our own monitoring, monitoring box. We are doing the PT query digest, show full process list, these kind of things. Of course, we will integrate with our Slack as well. And also, we push the status to the S3. So from, from database engineer perspective, we are able to monitor uh, these kind of things uh, compared to before. It makes us be more visibility for our database. So. Yeah, so what's the issues we met? We are still need to manually to work on the daily database operations. Let's say we need to create user for developers. They want to query our database. We don't share the user. So for each developer, we create dedicated user for them. So we are still need to do this manually. The second thing is that there's lack of standard workflow for database operations. Because before they join, I'm the only one to do all of these things. So we are let off the standard workflow to the database operations. They were causing issues if one day I forgot. So we are trying to st standardize all these kind of operations. And also a third thing, there's no checking for all the changes in the database. Let's say we need to add one more column into one table. Yeah, we are, there's no checking for, this, for these changes. So if we, we are trying to solve all of these issues. So what's the uh, next upgrade? Currently, we are building our GAP, which is called Grab Automation Platform. Since we have more resources at this moment. Yeah, so the target is we automate 90% plus of the operation works. So the final target is that we don't want to do any work, just let the system to do that. And also we, we are going to standardize all the workflow for the database operations. It will help us a lot. Uh, besides that, we are also trying to track all the changes in the database. Well, if something happens, we still have this kind of history, we can track back to see uh, what, what changes. So what's the causing the issues? Okay, so what's next? We are trying to time plus, uh, time plus our, uh, time times our infrastructure. We are still exploring. So, of course, AWS Aurora is one of our choice. We are still, we are also considering to run MySQL on EC2 to have more flexibilities compared to RDS service. So data sharding, so proxy SQL, spider engine, maybe grab sharding, we are trying to build ourselves. MySQL cluster is also a choice, like Galera and InnoDB cluster. So we are also considering like geo shardings. Think we are running like across source session. We are thinking about that. So okay. As I, as, I mean, the lessons we learned for these two years since I joined Grab in 2015. So I feel like databases are probably the most complex things in our stack because everyone, every service needs to communicate with the database. So it makes the database much more complicated to troubleshooting, to like performance tuning, this kind of stuff. 
So please understand your database and use it correctly. And also take time to understand at a deeper level, then you will become more important as you scale and mature. And also we are trying to always try to scale out instead of scale up. Yeah. Can we elaborate on the third one, sorry? Hmm? Can we elaborate, elaborate on the third one? The third one? Third one. Because we are, as Lube mentioned before, once you scale up, usually it's like you upgrade your instance type. There's a limitation. Uh, let's say for currently our IDS, the maximum you can upgrade to 8x. But if let's say you already update your database to 8x, there are some issues happens. You are not able to solve it. We are trying to like to go through this way. We add more servers. Right, is able to solve it. Then we'll be we consider the scale up instead of scale up. Yeah. Thanks. So this is the final thoughts on my SQL. So almost every major te technical companies they are well using my SQL in certain forms. Yeah. So I feel my SQL is really flexible. If you understand it well, and you can hack it to suit your requirements. And also, like, we see a lot of improvements from MySQL in recent years. So we are still trying to use it as much as we can. Okay. Uh, questions and answers? I have a question. Yeah. How is going to help you for your RPO and RDU rather than using on RDS? Um, question again. Okay, the question is, uh, in one of the slides you mentioned you're going for MySQL on PC2 instance. Yeah. So how is going to help you for RPO and RDU as compared to having on RDS? For recovery time. Recovery time. So, so we're we're looking at. Uh, running some of our MySQL servers in EC2, mainly because we want to have a more flexible topology. Uh, we can do a few more different things when we run it on EC2. We can access and tune certain parameters that are not uh, exposed if we are using RDS. So we're looking at very specific use cases, and most of those are around performance and higher availability than what can be provided by the automated failover mechanism that is available in RDS. So uh, we're only looking at using EC2 when there are specific limitations of RDS that we cannot that we cannot work around. So that's why we are looking at EC2. At the moment, I don't think we are looking at replacing everything and running it in EC2. Kind of user that you had uh, long running SQL queries. Yeah. Because typically it means right in the CPU and uh, Yes. What are those long, what kind of queries are long running? I think let's say you are running a full table scan, your table is too, too large. Of course, you can see that you are consuming more resources to finish your queries. But if your table is too large, you may not be able to finish it. I mean, yeah, within a few hours. Yeah. Um, just curious, you all do transactional queries and analytical queries in the same database, or do you all split into like an offline data warehouse versus a production data? You want to answer this? <laughs> so, there's two different questions there. So, I'll answer the analytical one first. So, we don't do analytics on MySQL. We used to do analytics on MySQL, but it was also a separate MySQL. If you try to run analytical queries in your production MySQL database, you're just asking for trouble because <laughs> it will lock up everything. Because those queries are meant to be slow. And you don't run it on the database that's meant to run fast. So now our architecture is we suck the data out of MySQL. Uh, so the data engineering team has a lot of queries, uh, ETL queries that pull data out of MySQL databases. Uh, we used to use a data warehouse called Redshift 
in AWS very heavily. Right now, we've also changed the architecture a bit to use uh, the S3 as our data lake, and we run EMR clusters, and we run the Presto query engine. So that is our analytics. As for transactional queries, we generally we don't use we don't run transactions in MySQL. So we use MySQL, but we don't use transactions. We don't run complex joins. We don't run a lot of the things that actually require MySQL. We use it a lot more like almost like a key value store, if you want to say that. But with a SQL query engine on top. So we made that decision quite early on because that simplifies a lot of things, allows us to scale up much easier. So, but in certain use cases like the financial transactions, those we, we will of course go for where the transaction where ACID is required, we will use it. But most of the time, those things are not required, so we don't use it most of the time. I think that was a question. Yeah, I have another question. My name is Gora. Yep. Uh, can you tell us the top five service endpoints which generate so much load in your database? Why or whether you're using caching or not? Fantastic. <coughs> do you know what an endpoint is? I remember. I <laughs> I the two questions, one is on caching. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, for the first one, we definitely do caching. And that was illustrating the first slide where it said, um, we, we pretty much have uh, Elastic Cache uh, in front of the DB all the time. Um, everything gets put into Elastic Cache at one point, and we leave from there at certain times. Um, with regards to what causes the main load, um, there's two aspects to it. First one is our operations portal. Um, internally, we call it Emma. Basically, you know, you have your customer service team, they would, they would get a call from a driver, so they do some search queries. You know, business teams will be like, oh, how many bookings are we doing? And they'll be doing, so they'll be doing search queries, which generally are not fast. So they'll be like, oh, I want to find all of these drivers in this driver group. It's going to take a few seconds anyways. So those are not, in terms of throughput, they're not, they're, they're not they're pretty low. But in terms of query speed, that's quite slow. Uh, in terms of throughput, it's mainly, if you use Grab, uh, while you're waiting for your driver to come, that's that has huge number of operations because we are getting driver locations every second. We are, you know, looking up each time we are hitting an API call every second back to the server, and so that that's probably fifty percent of our API throughput. That's big, so that's probably the rest. So you said you're trying not to use uh, joins. Can you expand a little bit on that? How do you manage to have such a complicated system and not? So essentially then you just join it in your code, right? So you make your code query across the different data sources that it needs to access and then do whatever manipulation you want inside your code. Okay, so that, that means the 200 databases have, uh, this is why you can do this, because you don't need to join them. So you can yeah, them. yeah. So it's designed in such a way that every single database, so so all the tables that reside in different databases usually belong to a specific service, so that data doesn't need to be joined. Let's say our POI service doesn't need to have data joined against our booking service, because they are completely independent services. So internally in a POI service, they might join certain things. But generally, we run very few joins. Does, does it mean that your data is denormalized a lot? Like, I would assume there's a lot of things that every service would need to know about. Like yeah. Profile or something like that. Uh, yes, most of the data is quite denormalized. So we don't do a lot of, like, what you would call textbook proper database design, normalizing everything properly. So we design the database for performance and for ease of operation and for scalability, not necessarily for like storage or for I don't know, for for the usual reasons why you would normalize the database. Yeah, so last one. 
before we move to the next one. Can you share some learnings or design trade-offs around choosing partition keys for sharding? We don't shard. We shard at the service level. Yeah. So for every every group or every action, it has a as a, as a service. That's that's how it's shard. So let me repeat. Uh, so I, when I say we don't shard, when when you when people say sharding is usually like one table distributed across multiple databases. Each database contains a specific subset of the data. We don't do that kind of sharding, but how we shard is like, how I just mentioned, we shard. Different services have each of their own individual databases. Sometimes one service might access data across three or four different databases, and each database just contains one massive table. So it's sharded like that, but it's not what people usually say. So this kind of sharding doesn't involve partition keys or anything. So it, is actually much more straightforward to implement. Okay, so that's all for the first time. We still have some time for question and answers. If you still have, we will go to them at the end.